Is outside of Kiev were hit, partially collapsed. A huge explosion occurred in the main square of Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. These aren't military targets. They are places where civilians work and families live. Kharkiv is one of the largest Russian-speaking cities in Europe. It's fewer than 50 miles from Belgorod, its sister city in Russia. And Belgorod is where the missiles against Kharkiv were likely fired. President Putin, uh, among the many uh, false justifications he's given for invading Ukraine, has cited the need to protect against an imaginary threat uh, to Russian ethnic and uh, Russian-speaking people. How is assaulting and bombing the population of Kharkiv, again, one of the largest Russian-speaking cities in Europe, advancing that purported goal? Uh, as President Zelensky said after the assault, uh, there was never a border between Kharkiv and its Russian sister city. Uh, two cities are, are joined in the hearts of Ukrainian and Russian people living on either side. Among the great damage we see from war, uh, we're seeing that uh, in, in our heat. We've also seen that the International Court of Justice has announced that it will hold hearings on Russia's action. Already the human costs of the Kremlin's unwarranted, unprovoked, and unjustified war in Ukraine are staggering. Hundreds, if not thousands, of civilians have been killed and wounded. There are now more than 174,000 refugees who sought safety in nearby countries. Millions of Ukrainians still in Ukraine uh, are sheltering wherever they can, including children receiving cancer treatment who are now living in the basements of Ukraine's uh, children's hospitals with doctors and nurses doing their best to care for them as explosions boom overhead. This is shameful. The numbers of civilians killed and wounded, the humanitarian consequences, will only grow in the days ahead. In the face of this violence, uh, the courage of the Ukrainian people is inspiring the world. As President Biden said in his State of the Union address last night, the response to Russia's war has been unity. Uh, unity among world leaders, unity in Europe, unity among uh, people gathering around the world to protest President Putin's war of choice, including thousands of people in Russia uh, and Belarus uh, coming out to protest peacefully, even though they know what they risk in so doing. Because the Biden administration dedicated its first year to repairing and rebuilding our alliances and partnerships in Europe and around the world, and because we spent the better part of the past several months raising alarms about looming Russian aggression, declassifying and sharing our intelligence uh, nearly in real time, and relentlessly exposing President Putin's lies, we were ready. In fact, one reason uh, why we're seeing the unified response now is because we made the decision late last year to publicize to the world what we knew was underway and the playbook we were convinced Russia would follow. I went to the UN Security Council two weeks ago to walk through step by step, the pretext for war that uh, we were sure President Putin would invent, and the subsequent military invasion that he planned to order. And that's precisely what he did. While Russian officials continued to deny it right until the invasion began, seeing that duplicity and premeditated aggression play out exactly as we had predicted uh, has generated outrage and solidarity across Europe and around the world. And that's turned into unprecedented action. We said that if the Kremlin ordered an invasion, uh, we would help Ukraine defend itself while imposing costs on Russia. Last week, the President approved $350 million in military assistance to Ukraine to help uh, with the armored, airborne, and other significant threats it now faces. That brings our total security assistance to Ukraine in the past year to more than $1 billion, more than in any previous year. 
over the past several days, I authorized the expedited transfer of U.S. origin defensive equipment from allies to Ukraine, uh, and we're coordinating efforts to get this equipment, including anti-tank and anti-aircraft weaponry, as well as small arms and munitions, into the hands of Ukrainian fighters who are defending their country with skill and determination. We're sending humanitarian assistance to the people of Ukraine as well. Three days ago, we announced nearly $54 million in additional support on top of the more than $300 million that we've provided in recent years. USAID has deployed a disaster assistance response team, our top international emergency responders, to lead the U.S. humanitarian response in coordination with European allies, partners, and international organizations. And USAID Director uh, Samantha Power was, as you know, just uh, uh, in Poland along the border with Ukraine a few days ago, uh, along with uh, other senior officials from the State Department. And we're working to support the frontline countries, including Poland, Moldova, Romania, Hungary, and Slovakia, that have welcomed hundreds of thousands of refugees, including many children, elderly people, people with disabilities, all of whom are fleeing Ukraine to escape Russia's violence and facing harrowing journeys to reach safety. We and our allies and partners will work to keep people safe, manage the flow of refugees, keep border crossings open, and provide critical supplies. At the same time, we're holding Russia accountable, including Russia's economy. Back on December 1st, I said that Russia would face massive consequences for attacking Ukraine, including severe and lasting economic costs. The United States and more than 30 allies and partners, representing more than half the world's economy, have made good on that commitment, with powerful sanctions and export controls on Russia, including additional actions just today. We've now sanctioned most of Russia's largest financial institutions and its sovereign wealth fund. The European Union removed key sanctioned Russian banks from the SWIFT international payments network. We've restricted Russia's ability to seek funding beyond its borders. Thirteen of the most critical Russian state-owned enterprises, including Gazprom, are now extremely limited in raising money through the U.S. market. We've imposed sanctions on individuals, including President Putin other members of Russia's Security Council, and elites and their family members. And we and our allies and partners are launching a task force to identify, track down, and freeze the assets of sanctioned Russian companies and oligarchs. We will freeze and seize their yachts, their private jets, their opulent estates in world capitals. Today, we're also imposing sweeping sanctions on Russia's defense sector. In total, 22 Russian defense-related entities will be designated, including companies that make combat aircraft, infantry fighting vehicles, missiles, unmanned aerial vehicles, electronic warfare systems, the very systems now being used to assault the Ukrainian people, abuse human rights, violate international humanitarian law. We're also imposing export controls on Belarus to hold the Lukashenko regime accountable for being a co-belligerent in President Putin's war of choice. We will choke off Belarus's ability to import key technologies. And if Lukashenko's support for the war continues, the consequences for his regime uh, will escalate. All told, these sanctions and restrictions have had a powerful effect on Russia's economy. The value of the ruble has plummeted. The Russian stock market closed uh, at, uh, as fear of capital flight uh, rose. Interest rates more than doubled. Russia's credit rating has been cut to junk status. The value of President Putin's war fund has vanished. And by choking Russia's access to technology, uh, we're delivering a blow to its economy and military that will be felt not just now, but for years to come. President Putin may have assumed that the United States and our allies uh, were bluffing when we warned of massive, unprecedented consequences. But, as President Biden likes to say, big nations can't bluff. The United States doesn't bluff, and President Putin has gravely miscalculated. As President Biden made clear last night, this is President Putin's war. This isn't the Russian people's war. It's becoming clearer by the day that the Russian people oppose it. 
members of the Russian military oppose it and had no idea what they were being sent to do. And now the Russian people will suffer the consequences of their leaders' choices. So my message to the people of Russia, if they're even able to hear it, as the Kremlin cracks down even harder on media outlets reporting the truth, my message is that we know many of you want no part of this war. You, like Ukrainians, like Americans, like people everywhere, want the same basic things. Good jobs, clean air and water, the chance to raise your kids in safe neighborhoods, to send them to good schools, to give them better lives than you had. How in the world does President Putin's unprovoked aggression against Ukraine help you achieve any of these things? How is it going to make your lives better? The economic costs that we've been forced to impose on Russia are not aimed at you. They're aimed at compelling your government to stop its actions, to stop its aggression. And just as millions of us around the world stand together against Moscow's aggression, we also stand together with you as you demand that your leaders end this war. President Putin wants to demonstrate leadership. He should allow Russian soldiers to go home to their families. Finally, the United States is continuing our diplomatic efforts. We're keeping the door open to a diplomatic way forward. That's going to be very hard to happen uh, without military de-escalation. It's much more difficult for diplomacy to succeed when guns are firing, tanks are rolling, planes are flying. But if Russia pulls back and pursues diplomacy, we stand ready to do the same thing. Meanwhile, our intensive diplomacy with allies and partners continues. I've been in virtually daily contact with my, my friend and counterpart, Ukraine's Foreign Minister Kaleva. And I've made clear that we'll support any diplomatic efforts by the Ukrainian government to reach a ceasefire and withdrawal of Russian forces. If there are diplomatic steps that we can take that the Ukrainian government believes would be helpful, we're prepared to take them, even as we continue to support Ukraine's ability to defend itself. Uh, tomorrow, uh, I'll travel to Brussels, where I'll meet with our NATO, European Union, and G7 allies and partners to continue our coordination, to commend them on the unprecedented steps that they've taken to support Ukraine and hold Russia to account, and to reaffirm our Article 5 commitment that an attack on any NATO member is an attack on all. Uh, from there, I'll travel to Poland, which is already hosting hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees, uh, with tens of thousands arriving by the day. And then to Moldova, which is also hosting Ukrainian refugees, and where Russian troops have been occupying territory against the will of the people for years. Uh, and then I'll go on to the Baltic countries, to Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, which are facing a renewed threat from Russia themselves, as President Putin seeks to reassert Russia's dominance over former Soviet republics. Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia are our NATO allies. And as President Biden has said, we will defend every inch of NATO territory against any aggression from Russia or otherwise. Finally, I want to note the consequential and historic vote that just took place in the United Nations. 141 member states voted in favor of a resolution reaffirming Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and condemning Russia's invasion of another member state. As this vote revealed, the overwhelming majority of the international community stands in strong support of the core principles of the United Nations and upholding the UN Charter, and stands against Russia's reckless attempts to change the borders of another sovereign country by force to replace its will for the will of the Ukrainian people. As 141 member states of the United Nations know, more is at stake even than the conflict uh, in Ukraine itself and the freedom and security of Ukraine and its people. This is a threat to stability in Europe and to the entire rules-based order, which has been the foundation of security and prosperity for people around the world for nearly 80 years. In this time of uncertainty, we have a clear way forward. Help Ukraine defend itself. Support the Ukrainian people. Hold Russia accountable and persist with diplomacy. 
President Putin is more isolated from the world than ever before. As President Biden predicted last night, when the history of this era is written, Russia's war on Ukraine will have left uh, Russia weaker and the rest of the world stronger. And in the days ahead, we'll continue to draw inspiration from the iron will of the Ukrainian people. With that, happy to take some questions. Hello, Mr. Secretary. Thanks for being here. Um, I just want to ask you, what is the U.S. assessment on Putin's state of mind? You said that he's more isolated than before. Um, do you worry that this isolation might prompt him to lash out and do something even more dramatic than we've so far seen on the ground? Um, and I also want to ask you, I'm sure you've seen that um, there are Americans who have expressed um, their desire to go and join the fight mm -hmm. in Ukraine. What is your message to them? Thank you. Thanks. Um, I can't put myself in, in President Putin's uh, mind or, 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 or state of mind. Um, all that, that we can focus on are the actions uh, that he's taking and our response to those actions. Um, I, I said before, one of the Achilles heels of autocracies is the inability uh, to speak truth to power. I don't know who said what to President Putin uh, before he launched this aggression. I don't know who's saying what to him now. Um, but again, all of that is, um, uh, is speculation. Uh, we can't put ourselves in his mindset. Uh, all we can do uh, is what we're doing, which is to be very clear uh, in how we'll uh, respond to the actions that he takes, to continue to work in unity with allies uh, and partners in support of Ukraine, in defense of Ukraine, uh, to help his people, to, ho to help those who have uh, been forced to flee, uh, and if uh, there are any diplomatic uh, opportunities to pursue, to, to pursue those. Uh, but we're focused uh, less on what President Putin thinks or may think and more on what he does. Um, and with regard to the second part of your question, look, uh, we've been uh, very clear for some time, of course, in calling uh, on Americans who may, be, uh, may have been resident in Ukraine uh, to leave uh, and making clear to um, Americans who may be thinking of traveling there not to go. For those who want to help Ukraine um, and help its people, there are many uh, ways to do that, uh, including by uh, supporting and helping the, the many NGOs that are working to provide humanitarian assistance, uh, providing uh, resources themselves to, uh, uh, to groups that are trying to help uh, Ukraine, by being advocates uh, for, for Ukraine uh, and, um, and for a peaceful resolution uh, to this um, crisis that was created by, uh, by Russia. Uh, those are the most effective ways that, that people who want to help can do so. You just quoted the president saying, big nations don't bluff. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that President Putin is bluffing by putting his nuclear forces on alert? And I had another question, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Uh, are you surprised that we have not seen more? We've seen some denial of services, but are you surprised that mm -hmm. we have not seen a more massive cyber attack against Ukraine or against other of the, the NATO nations or against us? Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that the legislation that just passed improves our ability to defend against such attacks? And if I could impose on you one more question. I talked today to Daria Kalenyuk, who mm -hmm. was part of the President in Your Democracy uh, Summit mm -hmm. this year. And you know how passionate she is, perhaps you saw her questioning. And she says that despite everything that has been done, and, and I would it, it, I would say it, it's a, an extraordinary amount of coordination mm. and agreement with the Allies. It's not going to get there in time. Mm. That convoy is sitting outside Kyiv and poised to encircle Kyiv, and they're not going to get those supplies. Mm. Um, what more can be done to help those people? Mm. Uh, Andrew, thank you. Um, let me take them in uh, not quite reverse order. Uh, first. Just on the, uh, the cyber piece, uh, two things. First, yes, the legislation uh, that you referred to is extremely helpful. Um, but beyond that and before that, 
Um, we have been very focused on the potential for uh, cyber attacks, not only uh, against Ukraine, but uh, against us, against allies and partners. We've been working for months, first with Ukraine, and also among ourselves, uh, to, uh, to harden, uh, to sharpen defenses. Uh, all of that work is very much underway, uh, including with the private sector. Uh, and so I think we have to be very much on guard about that, uh, that possibility. Uh, we are. Um, with regard to assistance to Ukraine, here's what I can, here's what I can tell you. Um, we are very actively uh, working every day, uh, every hour, to um, provide that assistance and uh, to um, make sure that, uh, to the best of our ability, it gets to where it needs to go. Um, and this is not just us. This is um, many countries in Europe. We're coordinating a lot of efforts to do that. And my own assessment right now is that the vitally needed assistance is getting to where it needs to go. Um, with regard to President Putin's statements on uh, Russia's nuclear posture. Uh, first, as you know, um, Russia and the United States have long agreed that the actual use of nuclear weapons would be devastating uh, and have devastating consequences for the entire world. And as we've stated many times, including earlier this year, um, following the meeting between President Biden and President Putin uh, in Geneva, um, both of our countries have stated that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. That was a, a key reaffirmation coming out of the meeting between President Biden and President Putin back in June. Provocative rhetoric about uh, nuclear weapons is the height of irresponsibility. Um, it's dangerous. It adds to the risk of miscalculation. It needs to be avoided. Um, We've assessed uh, President Putin's directive and his statements, and at this time, we see no reason to change our own alert levels. Thanks. Uh, Matt. Um, Secretary, thank you. Um, I, I, you mentioned the vote in the UN, which mm -hmm. was by, you know, it was overwhelming, as, as you said. And uh, the, the countries that voted against, the five countries who voted against, no surprise, Belarus, Eritrea, North Korea, Syria, and uh, Russia. But I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about the abstentions, particularly from Latin America, mm -hmm. uh, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, mm -hmm. who, who stayed out. These are countries that have, are no stranger to larger powers, who might shall go unnamed, uh, <laughs> getting involved in, uh, in their mm -hmm. internal policy. I'm wondering if that says anything to you. And then secondly, um, on the prospects for diplomacy with Russia, mm -hmm. which you said you're keeping the door open to. I mean. Really, what are the what are the prospects for uh, what are the chances of that happening? Mm -hmm. And are and 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 is there uh, if there is an open door, is it just for Ukraine uh, and potentially the Iran talks in Vienna, or mm -hmm. are, are you open to the whole gamut of things: mm -hmm. uh, arms control, mm -hmm. climate, uh, all, all, you know, mm -hmm. any number of other things? Right. Thank you, um, Matt. First of all, to put the the vote in the UN um, in perspective. Um, it is both overwhelming and, I would even say, historic. Uh, go back to 2014, when the uh, General Assembly pronounced itself on Russia's initial aggression against uh, Ukraine. Uh, the votes in favor of that resolution, 20, uh, in favor of a resolution uh, condemning uh, the actions of the, the Assad regime. Today, 141 votes. Um, that speaks powerfully and eloquently about the overwhelming majority of the world uh, and uh, its views about what Russia is doing uh, in Ukraine. Uh, I'm not going to parse the, 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 the individual votes. I think um, in some cases an abstention actually speaks loudly uh, itself um, as opposed to a, a no vote. Um, so I think you have to look at some of the individual countries uh, assess their relationship with Russia and, and look at how they voted in, in that context. For the small number that voted against, Belarus, the DPRK, uh, Eritrea, Syria, as well as, of course, Russia, as uh, 
Groucho Marx once sort of said, this is not very much a club that I would want to be a member of. Olga Kosciuszko. Oh, wait, sorry, on the, the prospects for diplomacy. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, look, as I said uh, uh, a moment ago, with regard to Ukraine itself, we, of course, uh, remain open to pursuing any uh, reasonable path, but it's very hard to see any path when the bombs are dropping, uh, the planes are flying, the tanks are rolling. So de-escalation, pulling back forces, that would open a path to, uh, to diplomacy. And, and we, I think, demonstrated very clearly in the, uh, in the months leading up to Russia's aggression that we were prepared to engage uh, Russia diplomatically on uh, any legitimate security concerns uh, on a reciprocal basis. That remains, unfortunately, tragically, horrifically, I think we've seen and you don't have to take my word for it, just listen to President Putin's own words, that virtually everything the uh, Russian government professed uh, to be concerned about was not really what was at issue. For example, Ukraine joining NATO. But President Putin has said loudly and clearly, and has now demonstrated by the actions that Russia has taken, is that what this is about for him uh, is um, Ukraine being absorbed in one fashion or another into Russia. He sees Ukraine as having no independent existence. Uh, he wants uh, to reincorporate it into, a, uh, into an empire. Short of that, to make it part of a renewed sphere of influence, uh, or maybe at the very least, uh, to, uh, to make it totally uh, neutral. So this is um, about way more than the uh, issues uh, that we were prepared to engage Russia on. So two, two quick pieces on the diplomacy now. One, with regard to Ukraine itself, first and foremost, uh, the, the question is if, if Ukraine thinks there is uh, a path that would help uh, advance its interests, uh, protect it, end the war, and we can be helpful in that, of course, we're fully prepared to do that. Uh, but uh, we really look to um, uh, the Ukrainian government to see what, um, what if anything, might make sense. Uh, th they're in engaged in, uh, uh, in talks with, with Russia. They had one round. Uh, there may be another one. We'll see. Um, but of course, the, uh, the demands that Russia put on the table uh, were uh, ex uh, beyond excessive. They were, of course, non-starters. And what we've seen repeatedly is that Russia goes through the pretense of diplomacy to distract and continue uh, it on its aggressive path. Um, more broadly, even as we've imposed um, and continue to impose massive uh, costs on Russia for its aggression and actions in Ukraine, if we determine that there are areas that uh, it's in our interest uh, to continue to pursue um, and uh, that in one fashion or another may involve some engagement for, from Russia, uh, we'll continue to pursue that. We're not going to let Russia dictate in any way what's in our interests and how to pursue them. Time for a final question from Olga Kosciuszko. <coughs> Libya, Ukraine. Um, just a few days ago, European Union uh, proposed to donate uh, their fighter jets to mm -hmm. Ukraine to protect our sky. But as far as I know, for now, this deal has fallen apart. Mm -hmm. I know that you were on a phone call with Foreign Minister Kulemba today discussing that, uh, this topic as well. Could one expect that after, after your travel to Europe, something could change and Ukraine will mm -hmm. get access to those jets? Thank you. Um, I can't comment in detail on my conversations with Foreign Minister Kaleva. We, uh, we talked about a lot of things, including uh, the ongoing provision of security assistance to, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and that is something that I will be talking to European allies and, uh, and partners about in a couple of days in, in, in Brussels. Uh, again, I can tell you, as um, I mentioned in response to uh, Andrea's question, that when it comes to vital uh, defensive military equipment uh, that, uh, that Ukraine needs, uh, we are very uh, actively coordinating its provision, and that assistance is uh, is getting there. But we'll probably have more to say in the next couple of days. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir, do you think that Russia is deliberately targeting civilians? You said they're hitting schools and hospitals. Mm -hmm. they're, are they doing it deliberately? We've certainly seen uh, in the past that um, one of Russia's methods of war uh, is to be absolutely brutal in trying to cow the citizenry uh, of, um, of a given country. Uh, and that includes 
at the very least, indiscriminate targeting and potentially deliberate targeting as well. We're looking very closely at uh, what's happening in Ukraine right now, including what's happening to, uh, to civilians. Uh, we're taking account of it. We're documenting it. And we want to ensure, among other things, that there's accountability for it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.